Okay, so it's exactly six o'clock and in the absence of the bells, welcome to the first of the UCM Talks lecture of our 2023-22-23 series. My name is Gail Curran, I'm the Higher Education Manager here at UCM and UCM Talks is now in its fifth year, which, which is quite extraordinary how time passes. Um, the intent of these talks is to focus on research undertaken by UCM staff and students or associates of UCM, um, both on and off island. And the series is deliberately eclectic, as you'll see from the overall schedule, and designed to encourage the sharing of new knowledge, new ideas and thinking. Um, five years ago, UCM Talks was, in, was conducted in the flesh, so to speak, down at the lecture theatre at the Nunnery campus. But when COVID forced us online, the feedback suggests that staying online is the best way to, to offer these talks to the wider community. And certainly on a night like tonight, when there's a easterly gale howling and the rain, I'm certainly glad I'm at home <laughs> rather than finding a car park at the nunnery. So, so welcome to our, to our fifth, fifth series. Before I introduce our talker tonight, Professor Ken Mills, just a few rules about how we, 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 we do this. Um, first of all, the talks are being recorded. Um, and we, we do this because it, we can then archive them and keep them. Um, they have in the past been held on the UCM website, but with our new Research Venom website, that's where they will be deposited so that you can watch again and others can watch it down here this evening. Um, as for usual with these things, it's best if you keep your microphone on mute until we come to question time. Um, and uh, Professor Mills will be showing a full um, PowerPoint slide show along with this, as you'll probably see on the screen already. So make sure you, you organize your gallery so that you get full view of all the, 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 the slides. Um, generally, we keep questions to the end, but if you wanna put something in the chat box, a point of clarity that might be important for you to, to check as the talk goes, please pop that in the chat box and I'll manage that um, with, with, with um, Professor Mills. So, to tonight's talk and tonight's talker. Um, following a BSc Honours in Biomolecular Science from the University of Portsmouth and then a PhD from the University of Southampton, Professor Ken Mills' journey towards his outstanding profile in both teaching and cancer research began apace starting at the University of Exeter and finishing now, for the time being, who knows what the future holds, at Queen's University Belfast, but that was via Wales and Scotland and other places. Professor Mill's cancer research has resulted in over 200 published papers and several book chapters. And he has, and he does collaborate with cancer research groups in the UK, Europe, Canada, and the US. Remarkably with that kind of schedule, um, but this says everything about the kind of human being that, that Ken is, he still finds time to work with charities and with, in recent years with UCM. And just last week, Ken was recognized as the 2022 UCM Honorary Fellow. We are very grateful and very much looking forward to Professor Ken Mills talking about silver linings, how cancer research methods and everyday drugs helped to fight COVID. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Gail. I hope you can hear me and thank you very much for that very nice welcome. Um, I never recognize myself sometimes when people talk about me because <laughs> I just carry on as a job. Uh, but please, if you want to interrupt me, please do. Uh, the group at the long line at the moment is small enough so we can almost have a discussion, but please interrupt me. So the title I've been given, um, or amended by um, uh, Gail to make it uh, more appealing, is, as she said, the silver linings, how cancer research. So um, I'm going to start off by just a bit of a background of what I'll be talking about. Looking at cancer complexity, because I think that's really interesting and exciting to look at, see how what we can take from cancer and look at the virus problem and the COVID problem by using repurposed drugs. So first of all, I thought we'd have a look at where Belfast and where Queen's University is and where I actually work. So I'm in this building here, the green building. This one here is called the Patrick G. Johnson Center. So we're just gonna have a quick whiz round the center for people who haven't actually seen a, a laboratory system or cancer research center. Quite nice, the lads are on one side of the building and the officers are on the other.
it's always interesting in that film because all they have, everybody else is being working and my group's the one that's sitting down having coffee in the foyer. So now I don't know why I show that bit, but uh, anyway, so back to the, the talk, looking at some global cancer data, just to put it into context about what we're looking for in the cancer world, and then looking at what we're look, doing in the, the COVID world. There's 18 million new cancer cases worldwide, uh, which is pretty impressive really when you think about the numbers and you can see how it's distributed. 48% of the cases are in Asia. Uh, but that actually, when you look at death of the rate, you can see almost half of the, half the people who get a cancer in a year, there's always 50% of people, one in two people are dying from cancer. With, um, if you just compare the top and the bottom figures, you can see that there's more, proportionally more people will die in Asia and in Africa than there would be in Europe with that. So proportionately, the, the rates there is a difference. Let's look at the cancer incidence in the UK. And we all know that one of the breast cancer and prostate cancer are the two most common male and female cancers uh, that occur. And they've got quite a few across this is UK numbers. Lung cancer, still pretty high and is continuing to be pretty high numbers of cases. And bowel cancer, gastrointestinal cancers come in number four. But what's not appreciated often is that blood cancer um, is, comes in at the fifth. It's the fifth most common uh, type of cancer, and it's called the forgotten fifth. And that's probably because people will recognize that as either being um, uh, leukemia, lymphoma, or myeloma, but not necessarily as a combination group of blood cancers. When we now look at the death rates for these patients, and as I said, globally, it's about 50%, but you can see lung cancer is 77%. And if we order these, you can see that 77% of people with lung cancer will die within five years. But again, what's not known is that 41% of people with blood cancer will die within five years. So that's quite a high proportion when you consider that 21% of breast cancer, 24% of prostate cancers. But actual fact, in absolute numbers, you get more people dying of blood cancer than you would do dying of breast cancer, even though it occurs twice as commonly. So it's quite a, a major disease, which is often ignored. So I often put this one up and say there's 137 different types of blood cancer, which why people don't always recognize that they might have a blood cancer or they may know leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma as being not three. And one of the interesting things is that none of these types of blood cancers actually have the name cancer in their name. So you've got chronic mesophilia, leukemia, you've got plasma cell myeloma, you've got all sorts of um, uh, primary myofibrosis, but they're all types of cancers. So if you look at the incidence, it's like any other cancer, uh, uh, it's basically an age-related disease. Uh, the incident increases with age, um, in all cases, and you can see that in leukemia and lymphoma and myeloma, it gradually goes up. It's quite common under 40, except for leukemia and the pediatric and children cases. But then you have that increase in sort of almost that exponential increase of uh, um, cases. 1% of cases are in patients under 15. So that's a, although you might hear of a lot of cases of pediatric or children with cancer, and particularly children with leukemia. Very few cases are actually down there uh, in that actually age group. 75% of all blood cancers occur in people over 60. And just to put it into context for the island, one person a week will be diagnosed with blood cancer in the Isle of Man. So here we got um, all your blood starts in your bone marrow. The other side of aging is that you've got less bone marrow as you get older that's active in producing your blood. In the young when children, basically all the bones are being produced in blood. But as you get older, it's only really the long bones in your legs and maybe the sternum that you're producing um, uh, your blood system. And it all derives from a stem cell, which is right in the middle here. There's a stem cell. It's been dividing. And once one cell will become the stem cell, and we say that, the other ones will go on to produce your blood system. And as they differentiate and divide in this, you can treat them in different ways and they become different types of um, blood. So in the top right-hand corner of the video here, you'll see this one starting to turn pink because it's producing red cells. You will see more red cells in your body than white cells, about a thousand to one, it's more active. 
the other types of cells you've got coming through here are neutrophils, macrophages, and eosinophils, which all are the larger white cells which are involved on fighting infections in some ways, but also cleaning up the, your, um, the dead parts of the, uh, the blood system, such as dead viruses or dead bacteria and things like that. So you can see the referred cells are now turned red with time. So where that's where they all map to. So you've got the red cells, which come out quite clearly, and you have these white cells coming through here. And these are the white cells that we're interested in. You also got the ones up the top here, the lymphoid cells, which are, you probably heard about lymphoid being involved in different types of um, lymphoid cells being involved in COVID our responses and inflammation. So if we look at this in a slightly different way, and anytime you hear a blood cancer talk or hematology talk, you have to show this, it becomes law, but you actually have to show a, a picture like this. We have the stem cell at the top and all this differentiates down. So as you get one cell, this starts with a stem cell, produces a, a myeloid stem cell, which then these cells start differentiating and be finally become down to this mature um, cells at the bottom. It's a very active and dynamic process because here, the red cells, you're actually producing 2 million new red cells every second. So it's very expansive and dynamic. And obviously, as part of that, you must be losing 2 million new um, red cells. Otherwise, you'll just get bigger and bigger and a big red blob, which isn't nice for anybody to see. So if we look at where all those cells were before, that's the stem cell, the one that was defined in at the top, which you saw in the previous video. And here you've got the red cells and the, the neutrophils and the xenophils down here in this particular area. The bit below the, the maturing things is the stuff that should be in your blood and everything else occurs in the bone marrow. So it's only when they get to this stage, they come out of the bone marrow and released into the blood system. But if we map onto this where all the different blood cell types or blood cancer types occur, and if DNA damage occurs up in the top, part of your arm um, in the stem cell, it's not manifest until later on in the blood cell development. So because it blocks cell growth, it stops. If you think about um, the stem cell as the baby and these things down here in the blood as maybe mature in population, um, if you like, what happens is our DNA damage in stem cell will block the processes in this particular area in the immature section and stop the growth like you've got um, an excess of delinquent teenagers being a, a, a occurring in your blood system. Now, if we look at various parts, you've got different types of um, blood cancers, and I've only put a few of them up here. And this is the regions where they may be affected. CML affects more than mature stuff, myeloma. But what we're concentrating in my lab, um, my research, is this particular area here, the acute myeloid leukemia of which is about 20 different types anyway, depending on where the cell is arrested or blocked in differentiation. Why am I interested in AML? Because it's the, one of the poor types of blood cancer, and I'm not sure if you can actually read this bit at the bottom, but this is 20% five-year survival. So about 24% uh, of five years. So one in four people will survive five years. And when you compare that to some of the um, other types of blood cancers, you can see that there's up to 80%. And the, the paradigm one is this acute uh, lymphoblastic leukemia, which most of the children with leukemia will get under 20 with children and young people. And you can see it's now 80 or 90% um, five-year survival, which is not good. It's still 90%, not 100%, but it's better than it was 40 years ago when it was down in this region here, around about 10%. So that's one of the reasons why I'm looking at this, because it's got a poorer outcome. It also affects people of all ages, although the median age is around about 60, but it actually affects most people, um, anybody across the whole life from uh, zero to 90 or 100. So why is it important? Because it also has this type of age group, and it has different effects and outcomes. I've said 50% or 20%, but you can see here, people with my, that type of disease, acute myeloid leukemia, have a five-year survival, uh, which is reasonably good, 65% reasonable. It's two-thirds are still alive. But if you get leukemia and you're over 75, you've got almost like a one-year 
10%, well, 10 to 12% one year survival rates. So it changes with age as well as the type of disease. So the decrease in survival rates are due to different types of patterns and mutations. The age and preventability of patients, obviously, as people get older, they become less fit for intensive chemotherapy. And they often have other things happening that just have cancer, but they may have already had dementia. They may have diabetes. They may have cardiovascular disease, all of which means you can't have very toxic drugs. And so the drugs do not work as well because you can't give them so effectively in the elderly population. So as I said, cancer is caused by DNA damage and the damage occurs all the time. All your cells in your older bodies are being bombarded by lots of different events, whether it's diet, the environment, from toxins or radiation, viruses or exercise, which can cause DNA damage. Now, DNA damage is associated with immune diseases, cancer. It happens as a process of aging, and it also has an effect on neurological disorders. But the big thing is that the body can really repair DNA damage very effectively. It has a great system in that dead cells with too much damage get um, destroyed, and the ones that do have them maybe need more than one damage to occur in that. So what I mean by DNA damage? What I mean by mutations? So DNA is formed of bases, uh, al letters, alphabet, T, C, G, A. And so if I'm just taking a six letters out of the, the several billion that you have in each cell in each of your bodies, apart from red cells, and you can look, what happens is if there's a mutated sequence, the C changes to an A, the effect to that is that it has a protein it's missense. It's not actually the same letter or the same sentence that might occur in that protein. Occasionally, you get an extra few bases inserted, so you actually have a few letters put into the place. That again will alter because each of the three letters, three bases, represent an amino acid. So you can see that that's gone TGG, which is fine, but now it becomes CCC, which means a completely different amino acid. So it means the protein isn't the same or it's truncated or it may even be completely nonsense and not working effectively. Equally, you can get a deletion which have the same effect again. You remove some of that so the bases and the amino acids are not formed so you have an ineffective or inappropriate um, protein working like that. So. so how can we deal with that in terms of therapies? What can we do? Well, let's think of a patient that has a mutation, as we said, maybe it's an insertion, and you develop a drug against that particular mutation or that particular gene, and you can block malignant growth. That's a great idea, and it has worked in one or two diseases, and it works in other types of sound, um, diseases as well. And again, then if you have patient B who has a different type of mutation causing their cancer, you want to use drug B which will stop the cancer growing. Sounds good so far. And of course, these drugs, because they're targeted against mutations, are going to be less toxic than chemotherapy. But let's look at the uh, um, in AML. As I said, we're focusing on my type of disease, acute myeloid leukemia. I look over the past 40 odd years. Uh, the number of mutations, we started off just with one or two being developed until we came across next generation sequencing. And you can see that there's a whole raft of different mutations that can be, occur in this type of disease. And if we look at a particular set of patients, this is just 200 patients. The patients are going to be across the top. So each of those little boxes up here, don't worry about the colors, each of these little boxes along here represents one patient. And down here, we're going to have the mutated genes. So it works out quite well when we talked about mutation A having drug A, mutation B having drug, and again, I don't want you to worry about what these names mean, it's just look at the different rows. You can see in this one here, you've got a nice group of patients that could respond to drug A. Here you've got a drug B, here you've got drug C, D, E and F, for example, which might mean quite good. And there's patients over here that don't have any mutations at the moment, grey means that the mutation is not detected. But if I start expanding this and look at all the other mutations, you can see 
there's a bit of a bar barcode going on. These people here that have got drug A, some of them might have this gene, some of them might have this mutation, others in different mutations. This group here you can see is quite a big collection of MPM1, but they also have either DMT3A mutations, don't worry about all these, just look at the, the pattern really, or they may have different patterns of FLT3. And you can see that if you look at this pattern here, out of these 200 patients, just 32 genes being mutated or analyzed the 32, and there's around about 70 we know can be mutated. We have 125 mutation combinations, which could mean we need 125 drug combinations, which when you look at the way that drugs are developed, it's hard enough to get one drug through the system, let alone 125. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. What also happens, and again, this looks a bit scary picture, but don't worry about the names and the numbers, just look at the colors. If you start on the left-hand side where the patient was diagnosed, diagnosed, you can see that the orange gene was the predominant gene at baseline. When it's um, taken some drugs and you looked at after day 29 of course two and day, 20, day 29 of course six, you can see that the orange gene or the orange clone has disappeared and been replaced by this yellow clone mostly. And as the yellow clone, uh, as you watch through the disease, the patient becomes into remission, relatively well, stable disease, and then starts relapsing. You can see how different colors appear representing different mutations. This one here, IDH1, was not present at the disease beginning. It was, and NRAS isn't present, FLIP3, have all appeared in response to the disease evolving. And I mean, you could actually argue that maybe it's even to do with some responses to some of the drugs. And you can see how they've then had to give them a different type of therapy, but that's not really changed very much the disease format. So not only have you got complexity of different genes being a diagnosis, when you treat them and watch the disease evolve, even with treatment, you have a change in evolution a moving target, really. It's like a whack-a-mole. Something else will come back up again, and you have to hit it with a different drug. So that means there's an unmet need for AML therapies, and the therapies that are used at the moment are basically poisons. They are, they're toxic. They're cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, some of these were first synthesized back in 1959 and proved for use in 1969, so you're talking 50, 60 years um, and Dornarubicin was identified in, actually in the, the soils from an Italian monastery in the 1950s. And all of these ones are very toxic and very um, non-specifics, which is why patients with cancer, their hair will fall out because that's a fast growing um, uh, tissue. You have diarrhea and vomiting because it kills off the gut bacteria. So it's not actually very nice therapies. So there's an toxic for use, as I said, in elderly patients. And so you've got two options, really. You want to develop new drugs or you repurpose existing therapies. And we'll talk about repurposing in a minute. And also the development of a drug normally is quite um, a long time. Um, you can take excess of two and a half billion dollars. Um, that's in 19, 2014, so it's obviously a lot more now. And from taking a laboratory study where I maybe found a a drug or a reason to look at a drug in the laboratory today, it may take 20 years before it actually gets clinical approval once it's gone through the system. We may be able to rap increase that more rapidly. But if we take a drug that's already been used for other purposes, maybe for diabetes or Alzheimer's, we already know it's safe to use because there's lots of people using it. So if you have a novel activity, you can do free clinical um, formulations. And you could probably reduce this time to seven or eight years because it still has to go into clinical trials in patients with that particular type of disease. So repurposing isn't really new. It's been used and it's gone on for a long time. Thalidomide was probably one of the ones that has the worst background in terms of those people who can uh, have read and know all about the thalidomide scandal in the 60s that caused birth defects because uh, it affects regenerating and blood cell, uh, blood growth, um, giving you limb bug formation abnormalities. 
now repurposed as a drug for leukemia and myeloma. Viagra was started off as a high blood pressure tablet, but people discovered it had um, other alternative uses, which we won't go into today. This is a different one, Finistrid, which can be used as um, uh, for prostate, was used to, in the 1960s to treat enlarged prostates, but now used for as a treatment for male baldness. baldness. And aspirin has gone through so many repurposing variations, it's incredible. It was coming back as an anti-cancer and anti-inflammatory and all sorts of things. And repurposing has gone on for a long time. This is an advert from Bayer in 1912 that showed some of their adverts for different drugs they were taking to. Even they were talking about aspirin at the moment. But as one there, I've blanked out because it has a repurposed thing but wasn't necessarily favorable. They actually sold heroin as a sedative for coughs. It was actually very successful as a sedative for coughs, but it had a very unusual side effect, which um, again, people are using that more, um, the side effect issues as opposed to the, the sedative issues. So we've been using a way of looking to say, can we identify more effective drugs from these repurposed drugs? Now, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration of America, are the sort of gold standard for approval of these drugs. And they have on their books about seven to 800 different drugs that are approved across everything, not just cancer, but across, um, uh, as I said, Alzheimer's, all types of cancers and diseases. Some of these are rub on uh, medicines, which won't necessarily be much useful, but with or sprays. So we took uh, a, a library of 384 of these drugs, and we wanted to see if they could work out in pet and combinations. Would they have anti-leukemic effect by putting them into combination over and above their effect for whatever they were being used for in the first place? So one of these things was, if first of all, 384, that's 23,344 drug combinations. And if we put it into a plate of um, plates, what we use for analysis, which has 384 wells, that's 190 plates, 191 plates. So you have a lot of plastic. And as laboratory research already accounts for 3% of plastic waste globally, uh, we don't want to contribute to much more of that anyway. We use this music approach, which means we put 10 drugs in a well. So we've got 384 drugs, 73,000, which actually reduces it down to 13 plates. So we've gone from 191 plates to 13, saving plastics, not just the plates, but also the tips as well. So we put all the cells into a drug uh, plate, and we then use measure cell death as a time of having all these drugs. And that can identify not just pairwise, but also triple drug combinations. What do I mean by a triple drug or pairwise combination? How does it work? Well, down here we have, if we've got 10 drugs, none of the in drugs individually have any effect on killing the cells, the, the leukemia cells. But if we have um, a hit well, you can see that in combination, we have a hit. So we have a high rate cell death. What you don't know then is which combination you have is. Is it one and two, one and three, five and seven? And we have to do convolutions, but we know that they're working together is more effective than being single partners, which can happen in life as well if you all work together. And so we use this for lots of different aspects. We're using it for AML, uh, both adult and my block, which we'll talk about in a minute, using it in pediatric children for because they need specific less intensive therapies, but also looking at um, people who have um, progression and issues by the, the leukemia spreading into the central nervous system. And as part of that, we're also looking at brain tumor using the music brain approach by looking at pediatric um, medioblastoma diseases. So I wanna talk about my block. My block is in a myeloid blood cancer initiative that we're using this drug screening genomic approach and improve that patient diagnosis, approve our, um, advance our research understanding and potentially improve the way we use therapies. And obviously we want to always improve patient outcomes. So try and adopt a personalized medicine approach for myeloid malignancies and other blood cancers to improve patient outcomes. So what do we do? We have a patient sample, whether it's a diagnosis or relapse. 
the standard clinical tests that are done, like the blood counting, looking at the cells down the microscope, and cytogenetics, which means looking at the chromosomes to see if there's any damage. At the same time, a sample is taken into the biobank for future research, which is consented. And it's anonymized so that we can use it for future research. But also then the patient will then go on to have chemotherapy and carry on in their normal standard of care treatment. What we're also trying to do is we're doing next generation sequencing. And I know you'll be hearing a lot about the impact of next generation sequencing in um, Dr. Glover's um, talk later in the series. But in this case, we're looking at mutations and we're looking to see about, again, this mutational profile, which I showed you earlier in those 200 patients. And again, we want to see if we can identify targeted therapy related to those mutations, which are more effective. So the problem, as I said, most patients are treated with standard of care. Very few mutations have targeted therapy, less than 10 out of the 80 mutations. And patients have more than one mutation. They can actually have up to four different mutations at any one time and probably more. more. So here we take the MyBlock. This is one of our robots, our laboratory type of robots. We screen the patients with a whole series of standard of care therapies. That's people usually for treatments we are being used at the moment. Novel therapies, and we also want to identify combinations of therapies. So we take those patient samples that we've got from the biobank. An example here in the table, we're just going to use seven of them. And we take the therapies and put them into the wells and we mix them together. So we put the drugs onto the patients and we look to see which therapies are killing uh, the cells for which patients. So here you can just see from this um, sort of like spreadsheet type thing that in patient one down the bottom here, drug A would be the ideal. In patient two, they're actually going to need a triple combination and so on as you go through. And you can see that actually none of the combinations in this example are going to are the same. Obviously, if you've done more patients and more drugs, you might find that they'll get more common similarity. And we'll come to that again. So here's some of the results from patients we've got. And this is the combinations. And I've only done the top half. You can see that if they've occurred, uh, say one, for example, has often some patients will have a DMT3A or they can have an EZH2. So you have one drug that could have multiple, uh, one gene that might have different partners. So we're trying to dissect out exactly what those combinations and what the common combinations are. Again, this looks complicated, but what it is showing is that we have these range of drugs at the top and all these ones are already drugs for different types of diseases. And you can see that out of these two here, either rubicin and prakinostat, most of the genes are associated in the patient actually respond to at least one of these drugs or these two drugs, plus a third partner drug. And we can dissect this out and bring this and we're expanding this out and we're having these, this is different drugs, different breaking down these are drugs. But what we're coming down to is we're almost developing a decision tree. We're going to do the next generation sequence analysis. And if they have DMT3A as a mutation, we're going to treat with bactidomycin. And a second and third drug that depends on the co-occurrence with the DMT3A. If it has a P53 mutation, the outcome for the patient is bad anyway. Um, so if you have P53, you're going to hit them, we think, with this particular vinblastin, which is a chemotherapy, um, sort of a cyanic, an aspirin-type derivative type of um, um, drug, and a serenifab, which is an uh, immune response drug. But for the rest of the patients, we're going to have this backbone of these two drugs. And then we have a mutation dependent. So you might have either rubicin prakinostat plus drug B, or depending on what the mutation is in the second patient, drug C, drug D, or drug E. So we're already building up this pattern down here of how we can use this complex mutation analysis and complex evolution of process to have an approach for developing drugs. Okay, so I've talked a lot about cancer, but the title of the drug was how we can look at cancer and COVID. So 
I'm going to then look at our um, look our way we looked at repurposing the same type of FDA drugs, but this time for COVID research. But I'm sure I don't need to remind anybody about the timeline happened two years ago or three years ago, is it now started around about mid-November in a few weeks' time. We had the first case uh, reported. The first case had symptom onset, and then we had lots of patients in Wuhan in China. Outbreak reported to Wu in December, and then uh, around about the 7th January, the COVID was sequenced very rapidly, very quick. And then 11th of March, the WHO declared a pandemic. And in between that, I think about the middle of February, I gave the last UCM talk before COVID switched down. So it wasn't completely my fault. But. So today, there's 623 million cases since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's six and a half million deaths over the course of the pandemic. Around about 1%. Uh, most of them were probably in 2020 when the, the big cases um, were, were before we started having a vaccination. If you remember back to the original thing, I was talking about something like uh, 18 million cases uh, of cancer every year and 9 million cancer deaths every year. So just put that into context about the challenges and uh, the differences between the two diseases. One of the things we did know, and this is an example of the spread of how mutations occur in the sars covid so again, if you start off with the base um, yeah, uh, evolution, and again, I'll probably explore this one in the future, um, is you have these evolving and the spread of the mutations that occur in just the virus genome and how that moved around the world and spread into the various um, variants, which we all become very um, familiar with, such as alpha, beta, gamma, delta, and omicron. Now, this is also, again, very um, in interesting. And again, it's the way that evolution occurs, similar to the fact in cancer disease, except here you've got just got the virus genome evolving. And it came as a bit of a shock to virologists because most of the virus ones started off as alpha, then it became beta. And as you go up the trunk, you became delta. Um, and you expected evolution to occur, but um, the following on with the next wave would become out of delta. The Omicron, which became one of the more uh, virulent type of came actually further back than Alpha did, so it came back as the, one of the roots. So the virus, um, the vaccines have worked very well against all of them, uh, but probably you want to try and target it in the trunk before it becomes into the variants anyway. So you try and hit the virus into the variants. And we all began to realize that there was two parts of the, 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 the SARS-CoV-2 or COVID-19. You've got COVID um, infections and it affected most of the tissues, all the tissues expressed the particular SARS-CoV-2. But the main thing was it had an inflammation aspect. People didn't die necessarily of the infection, they died of the inflammation consequences. So we wanted to ask very rapidly, could we adopt our music approach from the cancer field to identify relative um, COVID therapies? And so our timeline was for that grant was on the 1st of February, 2020, there was a rapid call came out from the um, uh, innovations and the, uh, the cancer research, or the, the, the research councils in the UK. And this was really clear. Grant, and if you use the grant processes, they can take up to six months or a year. First of February, the call came out with a closing date only two weeks later for our applications. And within three to four weeks after that, six grants were announced as part of the, the announcement with two and a half million pounds to Oxford to develop the vaccine. And we got about 10% of that to Belfast for a repurposed drug screen. And it went off as the um, NIHR website as the very first rapid progress for research grants for COVID therapies. There was actually about 90 different applications, so we were very pleased and to be awarded one of the very first six. So again, the rationale was because uh, SARS-CoV-2, as the virus is called, infection of airways, inflammatory response. Inflammatory response is extensive, damaging lungs and other organs. And we wanted a therapeutic solution. It was a combination of both antiviral and anti-inflammatory. 
could we hit both things at once with a combination of therapies? Remember, this is prior to um, vaccines or anything like that. And so we wanted to identify something that would reduce potentially impact in hospitals, but also potentially could be prophylactic that you might be able to take uh, on a regular basis. So we wanted to screen the FDA drug formulations and use our SARS-CoV-2 for the antiviral and anti-inflammatory activity. So to do that, we're actually one of the first people to manage to get the SARS-CoV-2 from the Public Health England and got sent across to the Belfast on the 20th of May, uh, which came from the, the initial York student um, uh, initial case in the UK. So this is um, one of the uh, group in action. And this is a number of things. This has to be kept in category three um, um, isolation. So this is the number of pieces of equipment, I think, on coverage. I think there's about 15 or 18 different pieces of item of equipment that somebody has to put on before they can go into that second chamber to work on SARS-CoV-2, which is obviously kept in negative pressure to, um, to, to keep it uh, from releasing into the atmosphere. And then... Alan put it on umpteen um, coats um, and headscarves and head protection and gloves and things like that. So we showed what we could grow um, the virus and how it infected. This is um, the Vero cells. This is a human cell line, which you can grow and infect the, the COVID into, and it will grow up and you can see that it causes these plaques, um, which is called um, bacterial or viral plaques, sorry, viral plaques. But one of the interesting things is this um, list down the side here, from HEC2 down to HUS7, are uh, all being infected with the same amount of COVID, but it didn't grow in all of them, which is really interesting that these are all human cell lines, so not COVID won't necessarily grow in all the human tissues. It may be that in cell lines it won't grow as well, but in humans that may be one of the reasons why somebody hasn't had COVID or has less severe symptoms. So here's our drug strategy, for, and you can see it's a sort of adaption of the one that I presented for the music already. Here we actually have 2,570 drugs, which um, remember I was only talking about 384 for the, um, the, the cancer stuff. 25% of them were from FDA approved drugs. Some were antiviral drugs, about 15% of the libel. And other were drugs that have been found because there was a huge push on research to identify um, drugs from in silico, looking at the way that the virus structure was and comparing that with drug activity. So we had a lot of drugs. We used them at this particular concentration um, because that's a clinically achievable concentration. We put cells into wells. We then infected the cells with the virus and let them infect or do their job and measure the effect of reducing infection and replication on the drugs. So we weren't necessarily looking at cell death like you would do in cancer cells. You're looking at the reduction in cell uh, viral growth. So here we had to optimize it. We had to look at the different types of cell lines. We had different positive controls, one of which was interferon, which we know in stimulates the um, immune responses. Remdesivir, which you might have heard about during the since, which is uh, an, an uh, anti antiviral uh, effect um, drug, which we know has been used as and been approved for some use in um, aspects of that. We wanted to test against different COVID strains as they appeared. We wanted to look at how much virus was infected, what the volume was, and which type of assay which we were looking at, which I'm not going to go into details of that. So here, there's um, some of the readouts. And again, don't worry about um, any of the colors or anything like that. The colors match back to the different libraries, FDA antiviral or the, the in virtual screening. But anything you're looking at above the dotted line with drugs that may be potentially interesting or this is just a single agent. So we actually found one, drug A, which was really interesting in our single agent screen, which we were quite surprised about that because we thought we were going on to have to, we have gone on to look at combinations, but we didn't expect any one particular drug to be effective on. So if we look at drug A, we're just going to go through a bit more of a drug A. 
This is the black line here, for those who aren't used to looking at graphs, is what happens. This is standard controls if you just use this DMSO, and this is a carrier, so that's fine. So if we look at remdesivir on its own, this is the one of the positive control drugs, and you can see from the blue line, it has a reasonably good effective dose response. Drug A, again, mirrored remdesivir quite well, actually, and was really effective on that uh, different doses, but it was still effective. But if you put these two together, remdesivir and drug A, you can see that you are really effective at a, a lower dose in both cases, but you can have a more effective drug combination by using remdesivir and drug A together. But the main thing was also that drug A was just as effective as remdesivir, which was really exciting. So we take that um, picture again, and oh, I've done it for some reason, so remdesivir is given by injection. Uh, um, oops, there we go, respond to this one. So drug A reduces viral uptake. So it has multi-purpose. Drug A reduces viral growth. It reduces viral activity. It reduces inflammation in some of our assays. It's effective against different variants and it's much cheaper than remdesivir. Remdesivir is about 2000 pounds per course. Drug A, was around about 40p a tablet. So a lot much cheaper. And it was also the advantage because it was a recent over the drug count drug. So we know it's safe for people to take on a regular basis. Unfortunately, it got replaced by, um, uh, replaced by the second generation drug in its field, at which the second generation didn't work in our screen, but the first generation drug A did. So the drug screening treatments, if we look at the now combination, we're now again looking at these drug combinations. This again is very similar to what I was showing before for the, um, the anti-cancer drugs, um, similar type of combinations we're looking for. And that again, just emphasizes we're using the less than 7% of the wells and resources that are needed for a standard combination screen of the 73,000 drugs. So leaving on to that combination, I'm leaving some combinations out because we're still in, in pipeline development, really. But this year, in beginning of January, we'd applied for a follow-up grant and we were awarded a developmental pathway funding, DPFS funding from the United Kingdom Research and Innovation. In this case, we're working in partnership between Queen's, Liverpool and Oxford, and we managed to get uh, one and a half million pounds for the next two years to carry on this work and look at other drugs for people who um, have suggested to be added into our combination pipeline. So just as a summary, like coming together, our drug cancer screening approaches inform COVID drug approaches. There's multiple genes involved in cancer. There's different genes during disease progression. So we have that complexity. SARS-CoV-2 variants evolve from a single virus and they keep evolving and changing uh, as we time and we never know when the next wave might come along with the different viruses. Our music drug screen can identify rapidly effective combinations for both cancer and COVID-19. But the project is only possible because of collaboration between myself for the COVID collaboration, myself as a cancer um, biologist, but with an interest in drug screening and Dr. Professor Alton Power, who was a virologist who didn't really work on drugs in that respect, but wanted to understand how drugs work, um, the viruses infected and um, worked. So we had that combination together, which is really effective. So thank you very much for listening. I hope it all made sense, and I'm very happy to answer questions if you have any. Thank you, Ken. Goodness gracious me. Has anyone got any questions? I've always got a few because these talks just set me off, but, but anyone please from the... The group got some questions for Professor Mills. Rory? Yeah, hi, Gail. Um, uh, Professor, I'd like to ask, um, using your my block um, sort of technique, can yeah. that actually speed up um, the bringing of your sort of results from the lab to treating patients? Can that speed that process quicker? You mentioned a 20 year cycle. Can that bring it much quicker? You still got to do clinical trials, I take it. Yes, we probably will still need to do clinical trials, but um, in some of the drugs. But that's 
some of the drugs are already in clinical trials anyway for the cancers and uh, for the leukemias and things like that. So we know they're going to be working on that. One of the processes it will speed up is maybe most effective is that you'll be able to target the therapies directly to the patients because of their what the hyper mutations and abnormalities they have. Uh, at the moment, everybody has the same chemotherapy and we know that doesn't work for 80% or 50% of patients because they, the disease comes back. So we, that will speed that up, but it will also, as you said, speed up implementation of drugs into the clinical trials, into the patient um, clinic environment as well. Uh, and supplementary question is um, relating to COVID treatment. Yeah. Um, the trials that you've done so far, are any of these drugs actually in therapeutic use for COVID? No. The ones in the combination, some of them are, um, but they, we're also we're looking to see if we can enhance their therapy on that aspect of it. Obviously, the vaccine is the first line defense, really, because everybody's going to have the vaccination for that. But that we're, um, we're having changed the thinking right at the beginning. Could we find a drug very quickly that everybody could take? Because we didn't know at that time in 2020 how quick the vaccine was being, going to be able to develop. We were planning on having drugs, and we still plan on maybe having drugs that can reduce the symptoms and the, the, um, the, the symptoms, but also the way that um, uh, people respond to that and uh, maybe reduce inflection rates down that. So if you're going from an area, maybe you're going to travel on a plane or you're going to an area of higher COVID or less vaccination rates, you may be able to take drug A as a prophylactic like you would do if you're going from malaria or type things like that. So. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, Rory. That was one of my questions. Was that the infamous drug A actually in use, but but not yet? Is the uh, is is the answer? Yeah. Because that's actually because it was um not used for as an antiviral. It wasn't actually an antiviral in the first place. It has to go through some sort of more preclinic clinical work from rushing down to boots yeah. to buy drug A, which we, <laughs> we might have been able to do. But um. Yes. Yeah. You can't anyone else got some I've questions stopped it all, so you can't have it anyway so. <laughs> all right <laughs> any more questions from the, the floor so to speak i'm sorry um, i'm not sure what your name is ned Deb. i'm sure if it's part of yes. it your head i tried to keep it um as simple but obviously it's not always as easy as that so. well no and i think that's one of the joys of the ucm talks because I, I think it's about just understanding there's so many amazing stories to tell from research from so many different areas of our, our life and that affects us and, and i think i certainly gain a lot from hanging in there when it goes over my head because it, it comes back and, and one of my questions is is this whole repurposing of drugs as a, as a non-specialist sounds eminently sensible so is it, is it a growth sector for want of a better word in terms of drug development yeah, it's one of the growth sectors. It's one of the angles of developing. There are obviously to have drugs in things where you want to identify new drugs as well because we're finding new mutations and new ways of doing things. But there's a whole repertoire of drugs that we know are safe to have. And they're probably actually having um, already anti-cancer effect, but we don't know it because if people are taking you know, uh, a, a diabetes drug, and I know that some diabetes drugs also have an effect on anti-cancer subjects. So you might be arguing, but you're actually doing that experiment already. Uh, one of the other drugs that we worked on by accident, which we found was an anti-worming drug that people take because they have worm infections, but that has a real good anti-cancer and anti-leukemic effect. But, oh, wow. um, you know, so there's, there's things that's already happening, but we just need to have that. But you also need to find new drugs and new vaccines or new developmental sure. ways of looking at cancer. Like well, even last week, as you mentioned um, before, the mRNA approach for vaccine development for COVID could be now turned against cancer. So that's going back in the reverse direction from what yes. I was talking about already. Uh, I think you in part answered one of my other questions, Ken, which was of, of all the repurposing, what was the most surprising um, repurposing? And I think an anti-worming tablet having having impacted cancer would certainly be uh, yeah, would have been a surprise. It is very surprising what um, you might come back as and you wonder how it works. I mean, um, for the, the, the music brain approach, which is actually a student of mine who's actually funded by the anti-cancer, some, uh, some legacy from the Isle of Man, um, has been really interested in some of the, the drugs that she's found that might stop CNS involvement in, uh, in brain, brain tumours and also in uh, the, uh, the leukaemia side. So, yeah. 
Um, if there's any more questions, because I'm like, truly, I'm the sort of person that will just keep going if you don't stop me, um, please, please butt in. Um, because one of the things that I was, I was interested in, Ken, was that the, the development of cancer treatment is now taking this personalised approach. When you understand the particular mutations a particular person's got, then there's a particular package, I guess, or combination. Were you, are you thinking that ultimately COVID type viruses that we might have personalised um, treatments or is, is it a different beast? Well, I think it is a different beast because it's you're talking about the one virus and you can only have so many different um, mutations. You can have lots of different mutations. But some are more aggressive than others. And I think there probably will be. And I see Rachel's online, so she might be talking about this more for, in the future. Um, but and then one of the talks coming up. But I think it, a bit like the flu vaccination, they looked UK flu vaccination is based on what happens in Australia and New Zealand six months beforehand. So you, you're going to have that vaccination process um, based on what and how the virus, the next wave is coming through. Uh, the flu we know spreads from Australia and the Far East across to um, Britain um, and the, the rest, but not sure how COVID might spread even faster than that. And you know, so, but that's, I think it will be, you have to look to see what the latest variant will be and have a repertoire of um, vaccines or develop a vaccine that's down hitting the trunk, not just the necessary, the variant branches. Mm. And this really is my last one, guys, I'm sorry, but I just find these things so fascinating, which is obviously an, an aftermath of COVID and it's not sort of over, is the, the very high numbers of people suffering from a, a range of conditions called long COVID. And, and so is there research going on around the treatment of long COVID that, that in any way looks like this um, repurposing and taking this repurposing approach? Yeah, I, I mean, it's difficult because, the, I mean, it is, could be that we, I don't know any, I'm not doing anything on the long COVID, but there's different aspects for you. You've probably got some lung damage that's going on in that respect. And so maybe it's not necessarily a therapeutic aspect that's going to do it. It's maybe actually to do with more physiotherapy or organizing that aspect. But we're learning more about long COVID yeah. because obviously when COVID, we nobody knew about long COVID and you don't know how long COVID is going to take to affect or how long it lasts. So uh, we're still learning about lots of different effects like that. But the COVID situation, I think, is going to have an effect not just on individuals in terms of long COVID. It's going to have an effect on, it's already had an impact on cancer treatments, cancer outcomes, because people never went to hospital because they didn't want to go and bother their GP or go to the hospital because they couldn't. So you had a lot of under-diagnosing. So you've had a, a sort of maybe going to probably see an increase in cancers coming along. But you're also probably also going to see an impact on around mental health because the young people or whatever they had to be locked down and their people living on their own for example may have a, I've got a lot more impact so there's going to be a whole health um, epidemic I suppose around on different aspects and depending on what happens and like that but not mm. all everything can be happened with drugs though so as we know yeah yep yeah. no there's a lot uh, there's a wide ranging range of impacts uh, yeah. from what we've just all been through um, Ken, that brings us um, really to, to full time and I just want to really thank you for the, that you did make it, you did make it um, understandable for the most part, even for those of us who was not specialists and that's a real gift because you told the story and, and it's absolutely fascinating and I'm for one, I'm very pleased that there's people like you doing such important and research in such a pragmatic way. Um, so a huge thank you. Um, as I said, this has been recorded. So anyone you, uh, those of us are here tonight who think someone will be interested in it will be posting this in due course. We just need to do a bit of book ending in terms of editing it um, to watch again or to share. Um, that's the joy of UCM Talks. And it's the joy of people like Professor Ken Mills who are willing to share their, their wisdom and their insights in such a public way. Um, as you can see, hopefully on the screen now, on the UCM website, the schedule for the talks for 22, 23 is up there. Oh, we have the next talk. Good. I was still sharing. I'm not sure that's come up yet, has it? So I'll oh, stop sharing. I'm looking at it. You stop sharing. Okay. <laughs> I'll stop sharing <laughs> mine. And that's better. It's up on my screen. Competitive sharing there. Um, so 23rd of November, another, as I say, we're deliberately eclectic. And this time it's the cathedral which killed him. My goodness me. And that's from Dr. Peter Lippmann, who is this year's honorary fellow. And, and Ken's referred to uh, Dr. Rachel Glover's talk in January. And then you can see what's coming up for the rest of the year so please um 
check us out, get it in your diary, register, and um, we look forward to seeing you again. But there's nothing else to say, but big thank you to Ken Mills and thank you everyone else for participating in tonight. UCM Talks. Thank you very much, um, Gail. If, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to email me or go by. I'm happy to answer any questions for clarification or anything. Brilliant. Okay, folks, thank you. Thank you. Bye.